Uh, it's a little more liberal in St. Louis, but, you know, Belleville has always been a conservative town. I mean, my employer, he knew I was gay, but it was more don't ask, don't tell, like the, like the military was once. And uh, so my partner and I, we kept pretty much to ourselves. You know, we lived together, and we didn't really socialize with anybody in Belleville, so to speak. That's James. He lives in Belleville, Illinois. Even though you can argue we've come a long way since the 1980s, stigma around HIV and AIDS still exists. That's why he has to go by James, which isn't his real name. On a cold February morning last year, I headed to Chicago's Union Station for the five-hour train ride down to St. Louis. Once I arrived, I snapped a quick selfie in front of the Gateway Arch and then hopped in a rental car, crossed the Mississippi River, and drove about 30 more minutes to Belleville. Throughout this series, we've talked a lot about what it was like to be gay and living with HIV and AIDS in metropolises like New York and San Francisco. That got me thinking. What was it like to live in Belleville in the 1980s, way before social media could connect you to tons of other people, when you were one of only a handful of gay people you knew around town? I will say after I tested positive, I did feel lonely then. Okay, because there was nobody else to talk to about other than my partner. Many men who were diagnosed with HIV in the 80s and 90s had to deal with a public reckoning with their sexuality. In a way, James was no different. His HIV diagnosis meant he had to tell other people about his life, especially as he sought medical care. Sometimes that meant awkward encounters, other times outright discrimination. The hospitals here locally, and I think even some in St. Louis, if you went in the hospital and you were HIV positive, you were guaranteed a room by yourself. They wouldn't put another person in a room with you. And uh, after I tested positive, I had a teeth cleaning coming up. And uh, so I called the dentist office and, you know, made them aware I was HIV positive. And they called me back the next day and told me they would not treat me. So that's kind of how... How did, you, how did that make you feel at the time? Um, well, it didn't make me feel very good. It made me feel like I was uh, contaminated. We know now that HIV cannot be transmitted through saliva, but fear that it could be was still widespread at this point in the epidemic. In Belleville, James often felt like he had to fend for himself. He didn't really know many other gay people or anyone else with HIV. So finding medical support, even a dentist, meant he had to start from scratch. And often, even the people he found willing to see him weren't used to treating people with HIV. James was frustrated. He turned to the only place he knew where to look for answers, the local newspaper. I tested positive in November of 89, and I saw little articles in the local paper that uh, Bethany Place, you know, about it was an AIDS service organization, and and how to contact him, where their address was, and all that, and it just happened to be... It turned uh, out that James walked by, by that AIDS support office. organization regularly, like on his way to the bank where he deposited his paycheck. It was called Bethany Place. It was new, and as we'll hear, James's story is like many others in Belleville, because of a Catholic sister he met there named Carol, who helped lots of other people like James. And so I finally stopped in there, and... There were uh, three nuns that were running the place. It was next to the hospital, and they were using uh, the hospital's facilities at no charge. It kind of took off from there, being able to uh, find someone to talk to. They had a support group, and I joined that support group, which was very helpful. At the support group, James finally met other people like him. Well, the meetings were a safe place, and you could talk about, you know, what you wanted to talk about without any... You could talk about being gay. You could talk about how the uh, infection affected your life. And, it was, uh, and I made some good friends in the group and stuff. Met some other gay people. It was also through Bethany Place that James finally found a dentist. So I went to Sister Carol at Bethany Place and asked if she could refer a, a dentist and she found one in San Luis, but in the meantime... 
Sister Carol was the first Catholic sister James had ever met. Well, I met her at Bethany Place. I had never been raised Lutheran, you know. I, I'd never been around many people of the Catholic faith. Faith, I guess, the best way, let alone nuns. Of course, she wasn't there in a habit or anything, but she was, of course, overly friendly and very concerned about myself and my partner. Sister Carol's story was one of the first I encountered when I began researching this project nearly three years ago. I came across a small associated press clipping about a Catholic sister who opened an AIDS drop-in center in Belleville. Belleville is so far from Greenwich Village and the Castro, home to large gay populations suffering from the impact of HIV and AIDS. Unlike in big cities, there weren't many resources or much education available in Belleville. Sister Carol, a nurse by training, realized this pretty quickly, as we'll hear. When she sought to help, she understood what other good leaders know. She had a lot to learn. From America Media, I'm Michael O'Loughlin. This is Plague, untold stories of AIDS in the Catholic Church. As someone who's gay and Catholic, I wanted to learn how people before me have managed this sometimes difficult identity. No time in modern history has been more volatile for gay Catholics than the height of the AIDS epidemic. So I've spent the last few years interviewing people who are right in the middle of it. People who fought, worked, and grieved through it. More after the break. Support for this podcast comes from the Catholic Health Association. CHA represents the nation's largest group of non-profit healthcare providers, with more than 600 hospitals and 1,600 long-term care and other health facilities in all 50 states. The Catholic Health Ministry cares for one in seven patients in the U.S. Learn more at chausa.org. Sister Carol Baltashevitz belonged to the Hospital Sisters of St. Francis, a group of women who have provided health care to the poor and marginalized in Illinois and around the world since the 1800s. Sister Carol later left religious life, but during the time we're talking about, when she was caring for people with AIDS, she was part of this community. She grew up in Michigan in what she said was a devout Polish Catholic family. She eventually joined her order and worked as an ICU and ER nurse. But feeling burnt out by that hectic pace, she applied for a home care nursing position, something a bit more laid back. That's how she ended up in Belleville, where the sisters ran St. Elizabeth Hospital. At first, her work was routine, though her new assignments took some getting used to. Sister Carol met her first patient with AIDS by chance, early in her home care work. Her supervisor had assigned her to someone living way out in rural Randolph County. So I went out there and I thought, why is she sending me all the way out there? Because this is like an hour drive, a little bit over an hour drive, one way. And uh, well, Sister and Carol learned about her new patient really from his nice. parents. He, uh, he was a young guy who had grown up in a very small town. He moved to New York in his late teens, hoping to make it in show business. He actually did okay, even landing a spot with the Joffrey Ballet. Which really impressed me because I loved the Joffrey Ballet. And. But like a lot of other young men in New York back then, he got sick. And without a strong support network there, he moved back home with his parents. And now Sister Carol was assigned to help take care of him. So she drove out there and she quickly learned that her patient was unlike anyone else she had ever met. This was a young man who until very recently had been healthy and athletic. And now he was wasting away in bed, unable to feed or even bathe himself. It just kept on coming back to me, because uh, every now and then we'd get one. 
And it was always the triple whammy, you know, the kid's dying, the family finds out he's gay, and then he's got AIDS. And at that time with AIDS, from the time of diagnosis to death was less than a year. Now remember, Sister Carol was a trained ICU and ER nurse. Her life's work had been to attend to medical needs and to help patients get better. But there wasn't much she could do medically to help this patient. He was dying. But she wanted to do something. So she transformed into something of a social worker. She helped her patients' parents navigate the complex healthcare system. She fought the insurance company. She called doctor's offices when they wouldn't come see him. And she grew really frustrated because she was used to being able to solve problems. But to her, this case seemed hopeless. He died. He wasn't home very long, less than six weeks, and he was dead. I came back and I said to my boss, I said, you know, I said, he's really sick, but I don't know what we're treating. And I think we're going to have to get educated if this is what we're going to be seeing. And she said, that was right. And if we're going to take care of him, then we're going to have to get education because you no know, AIDS was just coming up. We were hearing about it, but there was nothing a whole lot out there as far as how to treat things. One night, Sister Carol was talking with another sister. She told Sister Mary Ellen about her frustration in not being able to provide the right kind of care for her patients with AIDS. Sister Mary Ellen's eyes went wide. She had been having a similar experience in her role as Director of Pastoral Care at St. Elizabeth's. Like Sister Carol, Sister Mary Ellen was frustrated and didn't know where to turn. So together, they hatched a plan. Sister Mary Ellen called up one of her nephews, a young gay man living in Atlanta, and asked him for advice. At this point, HIV and AIDS was still very much affecting the gay community. But Sister Carol and Sister Mary Ellen just didn't know that many gay men. So Sister Mary Ellen's nephew suggested they go somewhere with a large, organized gay community, where they could learn about the needs of people with HIV and AIDS. As it happened, a former hospital administrator at St. Elizabeth's now worked at St. Vincent's Hospital in New York, which you heard about in episode two. The sisters called and asked, could we spend some time at St. Vincent's? Come on down, he said, because he said, I've got a floor of 50-some beds with AIDS. I've got an overflow to General Hospital. He said, today I probably got about 192 inpatients with AIDS. It was a crazy idea. Sister Carol had never even visited New York, much less lived there. But the sisters asked their religious superior, who reluctantly agreed. They arranged for housing at a convent, packed their bags, and got on a plane. I remember coming across the 59th Street Bridge. You know, everything was just huge and big and amazing and coming at you like, oh my God. And then when they drove up in front of (laughs) Sacred Heart Convent, they looked at this area and were like, seriously? Sister Carol and Sister Mary Ellen lived with a group of other sisters in a convent in Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen today is very different than it was in the 1980s. It was a neighborhood in Manhattan that experienced a lot of crime. There was a lot of addiction, poverty, And this group of sisters lived and ministered in that neighborhood. It was close to another Catholic hospital that also treated many people with HIV and AIDS. I remember the sisters told us, number one, don't walk next to a building because somebody will probably stab you. And if you're here six months, you'll probably get mugged. Okay. Back in Belleville, Sister Carol provided nursing care to people living at home. When it came to people with AIDS, that often meant at home with their parents. In New York, things were different. She remembers visiting a patient's hospital room. He was in the bathroom, so Carol sat down while waiting for him to return. She saw an issue of better homes and gardens lying on his bed. She picked it up to pass the time. But inside the better homes and gardens was, I don't remember if it was the Advocate or one of those gay magazines. Uh, Oh, oh, ooh, hmm, this is interesting. And it was all the different sexual poses and stuff like that and I'm like 
And then when he came out, you know, and I talked to him, and I said, do you do that kind of stuff? And, uh, yeah, he said, it'd make a difference. And that's what it kind of did. I said, I just had to be honest. I said, I really don't know. What Sister Carol didn't know was if she could provide compassionate care to a community whose lives were so different from her own, whose personal lives often ran contrary to the teachings of the Catholic Church, to which she had devoted her entire life. It was a shock to know that people did this, number one, this type of sex, and then the other types of sex that went on. Uh, Sister Carol began to think and pray. She wasn't totally comfortable with hearing so much about sex. She told me one day, after a stint working the hotline, she went for a long walk. When she got back to the convent, she vented to Sister Mary Ellen. I came home that one day and I said to Mary Ellen, I've had sex up to here. Sister Carol was a Franciscan. And inspired by St. Francis of Assisi, who once ministered to and lived among lepers, Sister Carol knew in her heart that when someone is suffering, Christians are called to respond compassionately. It's a bit of an anachronism, but Pope Francis puts it like this. Ministry is like a field hospital. When a patient is bleeding out, you don't scold them about their cholesterol. You help heal. Here's how Sister Carol put it. You can't even begin to talk about AIDS. You can't begin to minister to AIDS. You can't even deal with it until you first face your own prejudices and biases. But Sister Carol needed help confronting her own biases and prejudices. She was smart enough to realize she needed that help. Which is where Will and Jim come in. We're on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in what is imagined to be a liberal neighborhood in the shadow of Columbia University. It's decorated in a very eclectic manner with tidbits from our lives from all over the world. And uh, Will would like to throw all of it out. (laughs) That's Jim Deramo. He and his partner, Will Wake, have been together for more than 30 years. They met when they were both volunteers at Gay Men's Health Crisis, the advocacy group you heard about in the first episode. Jim was a journalist and educator. Will was a nurse. I met up with them in their apartment in 2018. They're both lifelong Catholics. So when they heard about Sister Carol and Sister Mary Ellen's arrival in New York in the late 80s, they were intrigued. I was impressed with them because at the time, there weren't very many uh, nuns that I knew personally that were focused on AIDS and caring for people with AIDS. So that's what made them different. And they were among the first nuns I knew to ever do that. Will remembers the pair were eager to learn. I like the fact that they were eager, and I like the fact that they were green, and, you know, they weren't brass, and they weren't aggressive and assertive like New Yorkers are, and that they had a, a genuine interest and a genuine kindness. It's not to, I, I wanted to be... A- Sister Carol and Sister Mary Ellen were in New York to learn about HIV and AIDS. Jim and Will knew a lot about that. And the four of them hit it off. They spent some evenings together outside of work so that they could have candid conversations about what was happening in the gay community. Will remembers one dinner in particular at a Chinese restaurant near the convent in Hell's Kitchen. And uh, I I don't think that they were accustomed to certain words, certain terms, certain lifestyles. Like what? And, oh, you know, I mean, like, you know, gay sex, what, you know, certain sexual practices, for instance. I'm not going to go as far as to say that they were country bumpkins, but there seemed to be uh, a, a, a naivete. And and I, I kind of felt that was refreshing to me, you know, so uh, even though that they were nurses, and um, but at the same time, you know, New York City is a completely different ball of wax than even St. Louis, you know, so. One way that Sister Carol began to understand the needs of the gay community when it came to education about HIV and AIDS was through volunteering on a hotline run by the gay men's health crisis. She said she learned through those phone calls that working in HIV and AIDS care required more than medical training 
It meant listening to people who were afraid, scared, beaten down. Some people would just call up to scream and shout and yell at you their anger. Sister Carol said that when she was on the phones, she had a binder filled with descriptions about how HIV could be spread in order to answer the questions. But the scientific questions weren't the most difficult for her. Instead, it was the range of emotions people expressed. People who didn't have anyone to talk to, except for an anonymous nun sitting in a hospital storage closet. And I mean, it was not only, I mean, it was grandmothers, it was mothers, it was, uh, you know, one guy called up and he said, I'm 76 years old, and I've been in the closet with, I've been married for 50, I don't know, some years old, and I need to come out. How do I do that? Sister Carol looked to Will and Jim to help her do her job well. And she was honest with them about her misconceptions and discomfort. I asked Will and Jim what values they tried to instill in people who wanted to work with patients with HIV and AIDS. Acceptance of, um, I guess, recognizing that um, people are people, uh, to treat them as such, uh, that um, everyone had a story, uh, everyone um, needed some sort of dignity and respect and comfort and love. And um, I, I think they were very mindful of that. I just pretty much reinforced it. Sister Carol spent about six months in New York. But the way she talks about it, the impact it had on her, both professionally and personally, it could have been years. She got to know more gay men than she had ever met in Belleville. And those encounters changed her perspective. She recalls one day in particular, when she saw a guy she had met. He was crying on the street. He was just shaking and he was crying and, uh, and he saw me sitting there and I stood up and he said, Hi sis. And I said, what's going on, Rob? And uh, he said, Josh is dying. Uh, and he said, I can't do anything about it. Then all I could do was hold him. The next morning, Sister Carol learned that Josh had died. But what she saw between the two men changed her world. You couldn't say it was wrong. I mean, the love that was there and uh, to see, you know, the care, the concern, the tenderness, the compassion that they showed for each other. You, you just watch that. And you, is this wrong? This, this, this can't be wrong. This was a pivotal moment for Sister Carol. She said before arriving in New York, she hadn't really known any gay people. But in meeting gay people, caring for one another through sickness and grieving deeply over loss, Sister Carol was transformed. Her world became bigger. She understood her commitment to the gospel values of caring for those in need in a new way. I started looking at my whole life and that's when I started to look at my own self. And I think that's when I came to the grips of who is Carol and where does Carol want to go in life. When Sister Carol returned to Belleville, she brought back what she had learned in New York. She got right to work and set up a hotline to answer questions about HIV and AIDS. That helpline eventually turned into something much bigger, a collaboration with the hospital called Bethany Place. Did you have any trouble finding? No, it was easy. The goal of Bethany Place wasn't just to provide medical care, though there was a clinic. This is the last place that we ended in. Instead, Sister Carol thought back to the needs of her first patient with AIDS. She remembered his fear and loneliness, and the frustration his parents felt in trying to make sense of the insurance and medication. She thought of doctors who refused to see her patients. She and Sister Mary Ellen, along with another sister, decided that Bethany Place would handle all those kinds of things, too. Uh, so we decided Bethany because that was the closest to Jerusalem that the um, lepers could come. In Jerusalem being the holy city, kind of like the Mecca, uh, they could not go into the holy city. 
and also Bethany was the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, Jesus' friends, and we could just say, oh, this is where Jesus really went to hang out, put up his feet, and have a beer. Uh, and that's what atmosphere is what we wanted to create, where people could come and be, be accepted for who and what they, they are. Opening Bethany Place wasn't easy. Sister Carol admits she stumbled a couple times in the early days. She said she wished she'd consulted the small gay community in Belleville that was already trying to help people living with AIDS. One gay man told us he didn't know what to make of these Catholic sisters who wanted to help his community. He said lots of guys had been hurt by religious figures. His own mom had told him he'd burn in hell. So he didn't immediately warm to Sister Carol. But eventually, through lots of listening on Sister Carol's part, he saw they were sincere. He learned about their time in New York. And he even helped raise money for them at a local gay bar. Bethany Place took off. But it quickly outgrew its space. And it wasn't clear if Bethany Place could keep up with the growing needs of the community. But now its future is very bleak. St. Elizabeth's is offering to provide a temporary building nearby. But each month more and more people are turning up seeking services, and Bethany Place needs a permanent and much larger location. It hopes the community itself will come to the rescue to help those living with AIDS or those just in need of information about the disease. Eventually, Bethany Place raised the funds needed to secure more space, and it became a thriving center for people living with HIV and AIDS. Sister Carol became a leader in HIV and AIDS advocacy in southern Illinois. There's a story from a local news show in 1992, just a few years after she opened Bethany Place, in which she talks about the stigma still facing people with HIV and AIDS, and those who work with them. You're watching Channel 9. KETC St. Louis. The hardest hit by AIDS have been homosexuals and intravenous drug users, but now heterosexuals, particularly women and African Americans, are seeing AIDS on the rise. Our first report tonight. By 1992, HIV and AIDS had hit everywhere in the U.S. While the gay community was still reeling and was affected in outsized proportion, every population was affected by AIDS. In places like Belleville, the need was great, and there still weren't enough resources. Workers at Bethany Place, an AIDS service organization in Belleville, already know of several individuals that could use the hospice. Here's how Sister Carol put it to KETC in a story about how she was having a hard time finding hospice care for Bethany Place clients. I have five people that I could place uh, very easily, and um, I know the uh, Belleville paper here had called me Oh, a couple weeks ago about that, and I, at that time I was talking to her, I had three requests on my desk right then. Bethany Place continued to grow as the epidemic got worse. But life for people with HIV and AIDS didn't get that much easier. There's the fear of the disease, which is still big time here, and how is it transmitted. And uh, it's just a uh, lack of understanding of the disease, and then the stigma that comes with the disease, and anybody works with AIDS also gets the stigma. Sister Carol was eventually appointed to a state AIDS commission. Later on, once Bethany Place was on more stable ground, she stepped aside. She was always seeking a new challenge. She started working closely with people battling addiction. Eventually, she ended up leaving her religious order. She lives on her own now, still in Belleville. After speaking to Sister Carol, I wanted to see what Bethany Place is up to today. Like a lot of Catholic AIDS care organizations that were started in the 80s and 90s, Bethany Place is independent today. It's no longer affiliated with the Catholic Church. But one of the sisters who helped found it is still involved. And as we heard during a dinner held there shortly before Thanksgiving, it still provides lots of resources and support for people living with HIV. Oh, yeah, yeah. Got candy yams, uh, vegetable stuffing, cornbread, ham, turkey, mac and cheese, <laughs> vegetable melody, uh, mashed potatoes and gravy. Today, Bethany Place is located in an unusual industrial-looking building. But inside, it's much cozier. 
Clients relax on overstuffed couches. Calming sounds play from a hidden speaker. And the large main room smells overwhelmingly like lavender. Sister Carol's early efforts are still bringing people relief today. This is a Bethany Place client named Stephanie. Um, my name is Stephanie, and I'm a client with Bethany Place. And um, I've been a client on and off for about 15 years. Um, I moved around a lot, but I always came back here because I always felt like this was home for me. Even though the organization is no longer religious, Stephanie said Bethany Place has stayed true to its Catholic roots. I think that's what mostly attracted me to it first because it was like, um, you know how God is love and, and I felt a lot of love here. When I, when I first walked in the door, because I was a nervous wreck, I was scared. After I found out that I was positive, I came here because I knew I needed services, you know, so the love was here definitely. It's definitely not a death sentence. You can live with it. Um, I've been undetectable for 15 years, and um, the medicine they have now is a lot better than it was when I first found out I had it. And um, if you come here, like, everything is confidential. You know, you can talk to any one of the guys here, and they're very helpful. And, you know, they can at least point you in the right direction or just give you a hug if you need it. Hearing people like Stephanie shows how organizations like Bethany Place are still needed today. HIV and AIDS is not a thing of the past. But it occurred to me that Bethany Place could very easily never have existed at all. As I thought more about Sister Carol's story back in the 1980s, she didn't have to do anything. The Sisters of Charity of New York, who ran St. Vincent's, were forced by circumstances in some ways to respond. People with HIV and AIDS were literally showing up and asking for help. But Sister Carol could have ignored HIV and AIDS altogether. She could have learned the minimum required to do her job, or perhaps even requested different patients. But she didn't. She went out of her way to help. She listened and accompanied those in need, all without much fanfare. I've known Sister Carol for a few years now. We spent a couple of days together in Belleville. We've spoken on the phone several times, share an email now and then. I don't know what ever happened to Chris after that. She's not overly um, sentimental. But one afternoon, she pulled out some old photo albums. Yeah, this is that Michael. Do you remember now him? That's a better picture. As we flipped through the pages, her voice softened. Yeah, they're both dead. And these were the kids of... She remembered the names of the men in the photos, as well as the years they died. Stephen, who uh, was Colin's other half. She talked about the love she witnessed, how she saw a community rally and care for one another, even in the darkest of times, and how that love inspired her own work in Belleville. One line she said about that love still sticks with me. You couldn't say it was wrong. On the next episode of Plague, we take some of your questions and we'll wrap up the series with insights about LGBT people in the Catholic Church today. Plague, Untold Stories of AIDS in the Catholic Church is a production of America Media. I'm your host, Michael O'Loughlin. This series was written and produced by me and Eloise Blondio. The executive producer is Sebastian Gomes. Thanks to the team at America Media who helped make this episode happen. Carrie Weber and Father Sam Sawyer, Colleen Dully, Tucker Redding, Robert David Sullivan, and Isabel Seneschal. Sound design by Rebecca Seidel. Original music by Christopher McCormick. Art by Sean Tripoli and Allison Hamilton. Parts of this episode were recorded in the William J. Loescher Studio at America Media in New York. 
This podcast was made possible by the generosity of Mark A. McDermott and Yuval David, whose gift honors and supports all LGBTQ plus persons and allies, past and present. Special thanks to Colleen Dully, Josh Kaplan, Anna Marchese, and the staff at Bethany Place. And a big thank you to the team at Nancy on WNYC, where we reported an earlier version of this story. That team included Matt Collette, Tobin Lowe, and Kathy Tu. For more about this episode, visit americamag.org slash plague. And let me know what you think by following me on Twitter at Mike O'Loughlin. Thanks for listening. Support for this podcast comes from the Catholic Health Association. CHA represents the nation's largest group of non-profit healthcare providers, with more than 600 hospitals and 1,600 long-term care and other health facilities in all 50 states. The Catholic Health Ministry cares for one in seven patients in the U.S. Learn more at chausa.org.